Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Stephen, and delighted that you are here this morning as we gather to worship our Lord. Uh, Just uh, one uh, quick announcement that I would like to give before the service, and that is that uh, today, um, after the service, we will be having a new members class led by um, uh, Elder Don. And if uh, you have been coming and are not officially a member, I would like to encourage you to uh, consider taking part. Uh, We would love to have you officially part of the Emmanuel family. Uh, Today is the uh, fourth Sunday in Lent, and we are um, beginning this week in our Red Letter Challenge, the uh, fourth challenge that we have, and that is giving. So everyone's favorite topic, right? (laughs) Um, But it's a wonderful blessing as we uh, learn how uh, best we can manage the gift and blessing of money in our lives um, and then uh, return to the Lord what he has first given us. As we know, our Lord has given us everything, holding nothing back for our salvation. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to all of you. Amen. Our opening hymn is God of grace and God of glory. Please rise. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we gather to worship and receive the gifts of grace through word and sacrament, let us first confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We now pause for a moment to reflect on our sin and the forgiveness we're promised in Jesus. Holy and gracious God, you have given us a world of riches, and we are unwilling to share, a world to care for, and we think only of ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, for those times your heart is saddened by our selfishness. 
Forgive us for the times we've given, not thought of others first. Enable us to see this world anew as a gift from you, to be shared and nurtured, and those who live upon it to be loved and cared for. We ask this, that your name may be glorified through the beauty of this world and the service of our lives. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy for you, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgiven all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given me all things richly to enjoy and that everything I have comes from you. May I never be under the illusion that I can outgive your immeasurable gift of grace in the person of Lord Jesus Christ. May I give faithfully, cheerfully, and generously of my time, my talents, and my money. May the motive behind my giving be pure and ever open to your scrutiny. We pray in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Good morning. I would remind everybody that uh, you were given this card when you come in. Please fill it out for your family and make sure you have any prayer requests that you want put on there because the elders on Wednesdays, we take all of those prayer requests and we pray over them. So please put them there. The Old Testament lesson uh, is from Malachi chapter 3. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. For the days of your fathers, you have, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord, <clears throat> the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer of you so that you will, it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Top of the morning to you. <laughs> and I just recently found out there's a really good response to that. You're supposed to say, and the rest of the day to myself. So from now on, when I say top of the morning to you, rest of the day to me. Okay. <laughs> All right. The epistle lesson is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 14. The point is this, whoever sells sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sells bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must, as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon texts for this morning come from all three lessons as just read. Scripture frequently mentions financial matters, which means how we manage our money matters. We don't need to crunch the numbers to see that when we add it all up, 
It's a lot. So it must count for something. But why? I mean, obviously we won't use money in heaven. So why does God mention it so often? Well, to quote George Bailey, comes in pretty handy down here, bub. Clearly, money matters. So in this morning's sermon, we'll discuss how to manage it properly, that we may see the value in this week's red letter challenge, that is giving. First, we'll discuss why we balance the books, plotting ahead how best to handle money according to God's word, lest it master us. Next, we'll consider God's abundant love for cheerful givers and his promise for those who bountifully sow, trusting in his provision. Then, finally, we'll ponder the sure treasure of the costly cross and the merciful reaping of our life's saving in the joyful giving of Jesus Christ. Well, as they say, time is money, which is why I plan on stealing as much of yours as possible this morning. So I hope you're comfortable. Just kidding. Sorry, we're not at the right spot, and there's a lot of slides, so (laughs) we want to make sure. Time is money, right? Stealing it? Okay. (laughs) There we go. All right. Uh, Deuteronomy says, The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. So how should we, his people, choose to manage the treasure and possessions the Lord has given? Well, by faithfully plotting. We strive to balance the books and plan where to plant and invest our cash. We look ahead so as not to neglect any of our God-given responsibilities, like bringing the first fruits of our tithes and offerings to the Lord, spending wisely, saving, and providing for our families, and caring for others outside our home who are in need. Now, there's nothing wrong with having or buying nice things as long as we don't worship them or indulge in the sin of greed. God doesn't want you to feel guilty about treating your wife to a fancy dinner in the city, spending some extra cash on that newer model with more safety options for your son's commute back and forth to college, ponying up the dough for your daughter's horseback riding lessons or even splurging on that silly Minnie Mouse brunch during your family's vacation at Disneyland. You might not feel giddy about that last one when the check comes, but you don't need to feel guilty. If you know your money, no problem. If you have the means and manage wisely, then by all means, go make a silly memory. Go meet Goofy. As long as you can afford it, plot faithfully and aren't neglecting the word of God. You can be a faithful servant without foregoing all fun and earthly pleasure. We can be good stewards without becoming Uncle Scrooges. And it's certainly not a sin to buy your beautiful wife a nice necklace. After all, Proverbs 31 says, she is far more precious than jewels. Obviously, there's a difference between occasionally spending generously and habitually wasting money at the expense of our families or writing off opportunities to give charitably. Thus, we must keep the righteous balance by plotting, because God certainly wants us to be generous towards all, but without being withholding from our households. As it is written in 1 Timothy chapter 5, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. On the other hand, our Lord also calls us to be giving towards others. But that doesn't mean robbing our spouse and kids to give to the poor like some lazy neighborhood Robin Hood or last-minute socialist Santa Claus. That's not philanthropy, just pirating, poor providing caused by a lack of planning. But we can care for widows without pawning our wife's heirloom pearls 
and fill some boxes for Operation Christmas Child without sending our own kids to school shoeless like orphans. We don't have to sell our houses and wear sackcloth to clothe the homeless as long as we're planning ahead and responsibly managing the gifts of God. By plotting out a financial plan, we can save, spend wisely, and provide for our loved ones without forsaking the task of caring for others. Sure, in some cases, we may also need the assistance of a professional financial advisor. Yet still, this right and righteous balance is possible. But in order to do so, we must faithfully strive to balance the books. On the one hand, we try to keep God's good book. On the other, we keep up with our checkbook. Keeping up with the latter helps when cashing our checks, whereas upholding the words of the other keeps our cash in check. The first guides the second, so that the second may serve the first. Thus, this balancing act sets our work on God's word. Because mastering money is a two-hand task. If we loosen our grasp of the good book, we may unfaithfully handle our checkbook. And if we can't get a grip on our work, we may tire of upholding God's word. Thus, before too long, we start to see that things start slanting. There we go. <laughs> Legs quaking, waist bending, hand shaking, arms flailing, books dropping, balance failing, pages flying, then crash. Your flat broke on the floor, your household's a mess, the bank's at your door, you're covered in paper cuts, the whole world's out of order, and you just bought a cat. <laughs> of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the picture. Balancing books is important. As Proverbs says, he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Obviously, we can't shortchange the importance of cash in its role in daily life. Money is a universal necessity. We need it to survive. Thus we work. But at the same time, we must also get our money's worth and not overestimate the true value of our earthly cash. As Jesus said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Since finances, are such a daily topic of conversation, it's quite common to artificially inflate its long-term currency. Even for Christians, it's easy to get so caught up in the rat race that we lose our way in the material maze, forget true lives, a gift unearned, and fail to get our money's worth. We must also remember that in the end, even the almighty dollars just a paper tiger, 25% linen, 75% cotton. It can be tamed, and with the right training, we can handle it. Ultimately, it cannot defend us, nor can it destroy us unless we let it, by succumbing to the hunger for stuff and social status, becoming consumed with success, and placing all of our faith in wealth and financial prowess. Nothing so easily ripped ought tear us apart or cause separation between us and God. Wealth is helpful till it's not, and we'll all use cash until we're gone. But then it's all just dust. The bank can't break us. Therefore, we ought to take stock of what's really important and budget our lives accordingly. As Jesus said, no one can serve two masters you cannot serve God and money. If we make money our master, 
No matter how much we make, we'll never truly be happy. Because neither gold, nor silver, nor cash, nor crypto possess lasting hope. Likewise, if we give in to sin and the moral bankruptcy of our selfish desires, becoming greedy, rob God, withhold from our families, and act uncharitably towards others, we'll also end up pretty lonely. Because breaking God's commandments results in shattering consequences. The first of which is you shall have no other gods before me. When we promote money, success, possessions, and pleasure to the top of the list, we're really demoting our Savior and declaring the one true God to be simply one of many. So bow down before no cash cows and serve no money masters, for idolatry is a dangerous business, a dying enterprise, and dooming investment. Rather, we must manage our cash, lest it master us, by taking God's guidance into account, plotting faithfully, and balancing the books, so that we remain loyal to he who is rich in mercy. Our second point is this. God loves cheerful giving. So may we remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Trust in him and with all things so bountifully. God loves a cheerful giver, be they an unknown widowed beggar or beloved famous billionaire. Furthermore, the faith in the heart of the giver always outweighs the gift in their hand in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, he delights in nothing more than sending a vast harvest to the plot of his bountifully sowing cheerful givers. As our lesson said, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Tithing, as described in scripture, is the spiritual practice of placing God at the top of our budget and setting aside the first 10% of our income, however large or small, as the first fruits we produced and our offering to the Lord, and all for the growth of his kingdom here on earth. In Malachi chapter 3, God not only calls but challenges us to tithe and trust in him. Bring the full tithe into my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Essentially, God's saying, put your money where my mouth is. Hear my word, trust in my promise. Place your faith in my faithfulness and see what happens. So if you've never tithed before and are intimidated by the concept, consider this. This call to tithe is the only time in the entire Bible when God gives us humans permission to test him. There are certainly many passages throughout scripture where he clearly forbids it. But here, regarding tithing, our God says, go ahead, try me, test me, trust me, and see. Even now, shall the Lord of hosts not open the windows? So sow bountifully, that you may see your seed flourish and increase beneath the pouring blessings of heaven's rain. Planning ahead and setting aside a designated tithe when we first get paid indeed serves well as a reminder for us that faith ought come first in our lives because God's not an afterthought and our first fruits belong to Christ. But just to be clear, tithing is indeed an Old Testament command, which we as Christians are no longer obligated to fulfill, now living under the New Testament of faith. We're not tied to 10%. Rather, we are free to use our discernment led by scripture to determine what we bring. As our lesson says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. Our tithes and offerings are not like paying a traffic ticket. They're not financial penance. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. We can't bribe God with good deeds or a few bucks. First, because they're insufficient. Second, because that's double payment. Salvation has been fulfilled in the grace of Jesus' sacrifice, which means we certainly shouldn't insult God or belittle our Lord and Savior by thinking we can atone for our sins with something as silly and useless in the kingdom of heaven as money. That would be giving under compulsion. Rather, we are to give freely and joyfully in trust. Your tithing, offerings, charitable donations, and general giving practices are between you and the Lord, as are mine. We each must decide privately which seeds we sow and where we throw. If we estimate the declaration written on our current U.S. currency, in God we trust, to be more than just a cheap sentiment, but rather a reference to the precious ancient promise found in God's eternal word declared to us by our Heavenly Father, then we've no need to cling so tightly or be withholding. When we view and value our earthly money rightly, we're much more likely to open our hand and sow bountifully, plan and spend wisely, tend and tithe faithfully, lend and give generously. If we trust God more than we trust funds, then we're investing our faith and love in something that actually lasts and shall only grow as time goes on. But if our trust is solely in our cash, then we can't be beneficiaries of the promised inheritance of God because our spiritual trust funds empty. Rather, we must trust he who makes us heirs by his grace, our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake became poor, so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. Cheap sowing foils our plot. It spoils the soil of our hearts and yields a weak and sour crop. It robs us of the joy God grants through giving, as well as leaves our needy neighbors in want. Without a doubt, our Savior desires more than the leftover grapes of a ravaged lot and a few last-minute seeds scattered reluctantly from our jacket pocket. Our Lord deserves nothing less than the first fruits of our labor, and the work of his kingdom is worth all the joy that we can offer. Which brings us to our third point. Christ's cheerful giving is our life's saving. As Jesus explained in our gospel lesson, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Parables are more than just short stories. They contain an eternal truth about salvation. We've already discussed at great length that the kingdom of heaven is worth more than all of the cash in the world. Therefore, we, like the treasure hunter and the pearl merchant, should seek it first and be willing to sacrifice everything down to our last penny for its sake. However, there's something even more profound here to be found beneath the surface of this parable. If we dig a little deeper, we'll discover a real pearl, a vast harvest, a sure treasure. Jesus came to earth in desperate search of lost treasure, the finest, priciest pearl in the world, prepared to sacrifice literally everything, including life itself, just to find it, own it, buy it. And that's exactly what he did. It's you. You're it. You're his prized possession, and you were bought with a price. 
The best things in life are neither free nor things. They're costly, yet given freely in the person of Jesus Christ, the love of God, the forgiveness of sins, and the promise of eternal salvation. But all of this came at a great cost. The price Christ paid on the cross was his body and blood, his life and his glory. Just because we read and pray and preach and sing about Christ's grace every Sunday doesn't make it any less amazing. Our spiritual debt's been forgiven, the records abolished, our sins forgotten. All praise be to God and his rich mercy. Your Savior gave his life to set you free from the debt of death. Jesus shed his blood to buy you back from the wages of sin. He paid the total cost on the cross and offers you the free gift of faith for eternal salvation. May we never forget how amazing this is, but always return to him thankfully and repent, trusting in him. The gospel offers a wealth of comfort. It proves that you're God's greatest treasure you're the one pearl of great value. You're the harvest the sower desired. You're the reward of our Savior's labor. You are the love he died for. Yours is the life he gave his own for. God loves a cheerful giver, especially the one that he gave in love for us, his only begotten son, Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus decided to sacrificially offer his life for our forgiveness and endure the costly cross for the joy that was set before him, our salvation, meaning Jesus' cheerful giving was our life's saving and in faith will inherit his heavenly fortune because the greatest treasure isn't sold in stores, it's what's in store for our souls in heaven. And unlike an earthly retirement plan, nothing can eat away from its payoff in the end. The reward we'll reap in faith is certain. Our life saving is everlasting. Money doesn't go grow on trees, but a sure treasure, our Lord and Savior, was hung from one. And the sacred fruit of his merciful labor is rich enough to sustain us forever. So manage your cash, but treasure your Savior. Balancing the books is essential for faithful plotting. And cheerfully giving is essential for bountifully sowing. But only faith in our life saving is essential for eternal reaping. God is with us. So in his gift of grace, may we trust and live, forgiven and free, to freely give. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We now join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. Please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Great Physician, enlighten our eyes by your blessed gospel and hide us in your shelter in the day of trouble. Provide a home in your church for those cast out by this world and unite them with us in the pure confession of your name. 
Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, your Son abides among his saints in the temple of his church. Shelter all those who seek refuge under the cover of his tent, and raise up pastors in every age to serve them in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Father, through holy baptism, you have brought us into the light of Christ. Guide us always in your ways, and teach us to know your will, that we would do what is good and right and true. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, those who wait for your salvation have the promise that you will not forsake them. Lead those who wander in darkness through rough places, that they would find the way of righteousness and not be put to shame. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, you have promised that what we suffer does not condemn us, but instead displays your glory. Sustain the afflicted in body or soul, especially all of those in need of our prayers this morning, including Tony Riggio, who is hospitalized with health is heart issues, Ken Schwint, that he may have a successful heart surgery this Monday. We pray for healing and strength for Gary, Cookie, Chelsea, Mary Lou, Tom, Kaz, Doug, Linda, Susan, Betsy, Joe, Barbara, Edna, Nadine, Raymond, Jake, Nancy, Carol, Melissa, Jen, Marion, Mary, Tony, Shepherd, and all of those who are struggling with cancer. Lord, we ask your blessings over Bob, Charles, Karen, George, Nora, Nancy, Corin, Judy, Bud, Brian, Scarlett, Janet, and all of those we now mention either aloud or silently in our hearts. Sustain them, that they would take heart, trust you for healing, and find you in the midst of their trials. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, everyone who believes in Jesus as Lord will not be put to shame. Unite your people in a right confession of your word and free them from disagreement over your truth. Bring us with penitent hearts to receive the great riches of your Son's body and blood. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I believe the only announcement that I have uh, is that there's a new member class. Uh, that will be happening today after the 9 a.m. service. And um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the bulletin, so please read the bulletin and uh, keep yourself up to date on what's going on, all right? Thank you. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. In addition to uh, giving electronically by texting the number or scanning the QR code that is on the screen, we will now also pass around the offering plates. 
So if you have a physical tither offering with you, we ask that you would please place it in there as the ushers come around. And as always, we are grateful for all the gifts given to God and for the work of his kingdom. Amen. Please rise for the offertory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed good and right that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with you for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life, and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We continue with the Agnes Day.
may be seated.
in my life. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray. We thank you, living God, for the body and blood of your Son, which sustains us in the wilderness and the garden alike. As Christ has loved us in this feast, so send us to love our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending hymn for this morning is Take My Life That I May Be.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.